Other questions? Mr. Gross, a, a, disin, a disinterested observer. Yeah, Mr. Gross, if, 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 I, if I don't like your question, I'll move you out of your office. <laughs> Some of the things that you said prompted this thought that uh, Governor McNair served at a time when there was very little in the way of direct authority in the governor's office. Uh, governor Hodges served at a time when there was more, but still not total authority over the executive branch. Both men took strong stands with regard to racial issues. Uh, my question is, what has the structure of uh, state government got to do with the issue of leadership? A leader is a leader regardless of what he or she is handed. They've got, you've got to deal with the situation you're dealt. You know, deal with it. That's the hand you're dealt. You can be a leader in, you know. I'm a firm believer that a leader is born. I don't think you can go to classes and find out how to be a leader. A person's got it in them. And when, you know, I was fortunate enough to sit down, as Fred was, with, with several governors and work with them on projects. And, there's something there. In the case of Bob McNair, I think it was, he had a, a, a backbone of steel, but it was, it was, he came across so gently. He didn't, he, he was so soft-spoken, but people didn't, they knew that he, was, that he was the governor. You didn't have to have everything laid out in order to get a decision made. This is what irritates me about some of the things I see. Well, we gotta have this, that, and other so the governor can run, this, run the state. It takes some courage, it takes cooperation, and you can get a lot done. Think of what Bob McNair did to challenge Solomon Bloth, the Speaker of the State House of Representatives, who had been his mentor, and said, we're going to have compulsory education. The Speaker of the House gets down from the podium and goes on the floor of the House to denounce public education. And folks, this is when compulsory education, this is when the Speaker had the authority to appoint committees. He could, if you, if you irritated him, he could put you on the invitations committee. You know, and uh, there are a lot of political graveyards that, you know, promising young legislators, Tom Smith can tell you, that ended up on the invitations <laughs> committee. And that was, and guess what? You might find somebody running against you in the Democratic primary who was backed by the speaker if you crossed him. I mean, this, this was a real gutsy decision that the government made. Yes, ma'am. I've never seen Darren move this quick. This is a wonderful thing to behold. Do you feel that the fact that South Carolina was so late in coming into the segregation behind the other states, that that helped with the transition? That, that is actually an excellent question, which a number of people have probed, is that in many cases, South Carolina had the example of what not maintaining law and order and not moving forward had, had done. In fact, Governor McNair, and he mentioned, we look what, dis, look what defines got Arkansas and Alabama and Mississippi. And as Charlie Daniel and uh, Alistair Furman and other business leaders in Greenville pointed out is, after Central High, there wasn't a new plant open to Little Rock for the next eight years. So, um, yes, perhaps because South Carolina did come later, but again, I think there's a convergence of things. The state NAACP decided to do more than just go through the courts. The young people began to do demonstrations. But invariably, despite the arrests, they kept on, they kept on, they kept on. And all of a sudden, people realized, hey, this is not outside troublemakers. These are men and women who are asking for the dignity and the rights that they as American citizens should have. But coming later, I think, yes, that, I think that did make a difference. I would re be remiss if I didn't point out that that incredibly insightful question came from one of our McNair scholars. Okay. <laughs> it, yes, another question. He's coming to you. Roger, I want to ask you to comment on, your, uh, uh, on the role of local journalists uh, such as James Rogers uh, to, uh, to make things easier. Um, are you talking about his editorials? Yes. Um, the editor of the Florence newspaper uh, who lost his job because he said basically that the 
Brown decision should be, it was the law of the land, it should be obeyed. And then he had to say he was not a pro, what am I going to get his, his phrase, he was not a pro-integrationist, but he was an anti, like, it, it, he tried to make it, when he left, when he left, and maybe you know it better, the, the phrase, I can't remember the phrase that he used, but when he left, uh, he lost his job because of his editorial saying we need to support the Supreme Court decision. He wasn't pro-integration, um, but he was, I can't remember what he was anti, but he was against. But he wasn't the only one. The dean of the School of Education, uh, Dean Travelstead at USC, said this is the law of the land. We need to begin to prepare our teachers for dealing with this. And he was fired within a few days after he made that statement. Tenure or no tenure. Don't think professors' tenure is always involved. Well, it is at this place. I don't know about, I don't know about other places out there. That, that's because you won that award, you're saying that, right? <laughs> other questions? Walter, let me, let me ask you one question. One of the, the parts of, of the McNair administration, I think it, that's, that's frequently overlooked, is how proficient Bob McNair was in administrative detail. The truth of the matter is, that the, the, the Russell administration had a total of about 16 staff members in the entire office of the governor. But during the, the McNair administration, that office, largely as a result of the influx of federal programs, grew to about 400 staff members. So, if you will, over, 500, over, over five years, the governor's office grew from 16 staffers to over 500 staffers. And, and I think what many of us have observed looking back during that period is that McNair was able to accommodate all of those, uh, those incoming programs, accommodate the growth in that staff, and never missed a beat with regard to the administration of those responsibilities. Well, that's true. One thing he did is, of course, those of us who have worked for government restructuring, is that he would bring together the, the leaders of the different state agencies, the hundreds of state agencies that had a common interest, and said, gentlemen, we're going to talk to one another so that we can better serve the people of South Carolina. Uh, I was going to leave the public administration part to, to you and to Earl and, and Merle, but that, that, that's part of the story too, because in one way, because he was such a good administrator, a lot of other things were able to happen as well. I, it's interesting. I know three governors in South Carolina history, contemporary South Carolina history, that truly brought together all agency heads to have, a, uh, if you will, a coming to God meeting. One was, in fact, Bob McNair. One was Carol Campbell, and the third was Governor Jim Hodges. We could use more of that. We could. Ladies and gentlemen, Walter Edwards.